Welcome into the Atlanta Sports Party, your home for the best Atlanta sports talk. It's local insight you can't get anywhere else but right here at Locked On. I am your host, Tanitra Batiste, and of course, alongside me are Jarvis Davis and Maria Martin. The Atlanta Sports Party is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every single day. Coming up later, we'll dive deep into how the Falcons are going to take on the Titans and get each and every one of our takes on that. And of course, we'll go around the Metro as well, but this will be the J-Ville edition. Now it's time for you guys and for us to get the party started. Now guys, we want to jump into our top three, starting with the Falcons. Now the Falcons are back on the road. They're going to be right down the road in Tennessee to face the Titans this weekend. Maria, how do you think Desmond Ritter's rapport with Kyle Pitts will actually help or could help Atlanta in this game against Tennessee? Well, it could obviously help for a lot of different reasons. We've seen Kyle progressively get healthier. You've seen him get involved more in the past game. So let's say that Desmond does take his mistakes from last week and fix those and actually continues to grow that past game like he has been doing. Because I think one of the things that we get into with Desmond a lot is you see those critical turnovers in the red zone. Obviously, those cannot happen. But people see those and they automatically think, He's the worst quarterback on the planet. This Falcons offense is going this way. And I actually disagree because I think that they are growing. I think I'm seeing a lot of things from him that does indicate that he is playing good football, i.e. getting the ball to Kyle Pitts. You saw that really critical 39-yard connection. It was in the last minute of the fourth quarter in that game against the Bucs. Continue more of that and their connection, if it can grow and get better, it's only going to help them, especially against a Titans team who is similar to the Falcons in a lot of ways, but I really think they can pick them apart here. And it it could be a great opportunity for Desmond not only to grow, but excel, especially if you can get Kyle, who is getting healthier, involved a little bit more. And Jarvis, to Maria's point, we're going through a game where you're thinking, oh, cringe, cringe, cringe about Desmond Ritter and sort of his foibles, I'll call them, as in fumbles. Mm -hmm. But those foibles and sort of those missteps mentally that he was making throughout that game. But the one thing that uh, Arthur Smith always says is that Desmond – doesn't really make the same mistake twice. So two weeks ago, meaning two Sundays ago, you saw it be through the air, right? It was the three interceptions. This mm -hmm. past week, it was three fumbles. And let's be real. We talked about this before on a couple of our football shows, Jarvis. And of course, Maria, I'm sure you have as well. Those weren't all miscues and the mistakes and the responsibility of Desmond Ritter, if we're being honest about it. Mm -hmm. And that was, those were fumbles, right? That That's a little bit different. That's not something going through the air. So to you guys' point, you're seeing things come together in a way where I don't anticipate seeing the mistakes from two weeks ago that were in the air, the mistakes a week ago that cost you in the red zone. And I think if you couple those things together, Jarvis, then you're going to see that much more success chemistry and connectivity between Desmond Ritter and Kyle Pitts. Yeah, it's, it's there. It's obvious that it's there. But past few weeks, those guys been able to, you know, really find a way to connect. And then, then listening to Desmond Ritter and kind of, you know, talk about that, that connection and how it's been, it's been going this week, it, it kind of makes sense because you talk about the communication part, like they're communicating a little bit more when they're coming off the field. Okay, I know what I'm supposed to be looking for and what type of reads I'm supposed to make, but what are you seeing? What are you feeling? And that's that next level of rapport that you try to build with your, you're a unicorn, right? Like this, if you got to figure out a way to get the ball, this guy to rock. So, hey, let me make sure I'm communicating with him during the games, whether it be in practices and all that stuff. So all those things kind of have come together in these last few weeks. And we've seen, hey, yeah, if I can get to the, if you can get to the point where we're saying that Kyle Pitts is Desmond Ritter's fallback plan, yeah. Like that's, I think it's specifically on third downs because, you yeah. know, he's, he can, we know we've seen some plays. We've seen flashes this year. Like Maria said, he's getting a little bit healthy. He's, he's looking like that guy that they drafted fourth overall in, in a, in the 2021 draft. So those are some of the things that you just look at and you just say, okay, all right, this guy's starting to build, build with his tight end. He's starting to get into a, get into, get into a nice level with his rapport. He's finding his, his, his fallback plan, so to speak. And, and that's what can do nothing but work wonders for the top before the, uh, the Falcons offense, because at the end of the day, when you're getting teams to the point where they're starting to put that little mark on, on the, on the game plan saying, okay, this is a guy we need to watch out for eight. We need to watch out for eight. 
coming into this game, that's where you know Desmond really is, is getting his, is playing the type of football that they need him to play. Indeed. And when you look at the beginning of the season, you're starting out with two catches, three targets. But when you start looking deeper into the season, of course, the high against the Houston, Texas, seven targets, uh, seven catches, rather, 11 targets. That's when you know that rhythm is starting to be there. And also going to your point about the chemistry and the connectivity that can happen when a QB says, hey, and I'm sure he got some co-signs with some of the other team leaders, but they say, hey, let's have a player only meeting. Players only meetings are so critical. We often think about that those happening at a time when maybe things aren't going well. I think this team has decided, no, things are going well. We just want to be not good, better. We want to be best. So let's talk about how we can do that for ourselves. I also think that's going to be something that we'll hear about a little bit more in a positive way saying, hey, and we're going to see some positive results on the field as a result of making that decision. Now, here's the other thing, Jarvis. Let's just keep it real. Sometimes it's addition by subtraction. So the addition may come in an advantage for the Falcons, courtesy of the departure of one Kevin Bayard. Now, look, that secondary for the Titans was also kind of leak, already leaky, right? Keep it real. Right. But when right. your best DB parts ways with you at the beginning of a week like this, and don't get me wrong, I'm sure that they already kind of knew it was coming and had started game planning for it. But the bottom line is buyers gone, gone, and more gone. So I think that's an advantage for the Falcons as well. But do you feel like that is something that can also be advantageous for the Falcons to be able to maybe bolster their pass attack this weekend? Absolutely. Um, but I, I don't think it's going to change the game plan, though, because by like, Arthur Smith is going to do what he does. And, and then when when the time comes and when the time is right, he's going to find a way to try to pick that defense apart, because that's ultimately that's what you want to be able to do on a weekly basis. If you get to the point where, yeah, I know we want to come out, run the football, pound the rock, get the ball in Bajan Robinson's hands and Tyler Algier and all that stuff. But if you if you if you're coming into games and you start getting to the point where you are taking advantages of the defense's weaknesses, uh, and that's part of your game plan, you're able to execute that. That's when you're talking about that next level stuff. Because, I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, I know some people might not want to hear this, uh, specifically the, the the Desmond Ritter detractors. I know people might think I might fall into that category, but not necessarily. But you are you're getting to a point where if you remove those turnovers, I know it's saying a lot. That's a big if. But this, they have been moving the ball. They have been putting up some nice numbers. Yeah. You take away those 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 red zone follies. This is, might be one of the highest scoring teams in the league. So yeah, I think that right now, you know, coming to this game, then when you have this team is coming off a bye, the Titans are coming off a bye week. So obviously they've been preparing, trying to get you know um, situations uh right for their quarterback. I know we're gonna talk about that in a second, but I, I think that when you have a guy of Kevin Byers ilk you know all pro type safety get mm -hmm. traded away it kind of signals a red flag like all right so let's see what we can get for him let's get some value here and let's try to figure out the, a way to get through this season so you have to be able to take advantage of that if you're arthur smith in his offense you do and maria the bottom line is i go back to something that jarvis said right early on and that is the Falcons are still going to be who they're going to be so in addition to taking advantage of the things that are happening in that DB room for the Titans, the Falcons are going to take advantage of the fact that the Titans run, their run defense is kind of middling, right? It's not exactly a run defense that you need to be afraid of. But I think also the Falcons went back to showing us last week that, hey, go ahead and load the box if you want to. We're going to do what we do and we're going to be successful at it again, courtesy of a Cor Cordero Patterson and a Tyler Algier. And then, of course, Desmond Ritter also. Got it on himself um, on the ground, if you will. So if you walk away with 38 carries, 156 yards, regardless of whether Kevin Byard's there or not, there are still opportunities for the Falcons to show you their true identity anyway. Yeah, I mean, Arthur Smith talks about this a lot, right? Like you have to game plan for every scenario. And so I don't really think it matters whether he's back there or not. You have to account for anything that could happen. So for the Falcons too, it's funny because we – we thought we knew who they were, right, offensively. And then they've shown us so many different things that make me confused. I say that I'm confused about this <laughs> team a lot for a lot of reasons because they were a ground and pound team. We thought all they were going to do was run the football and then take last week out of the equation. They had two straight games of over 300 yards just from yes. the quarterback alone yeah. through the air. That's not something that any of us thought that 
they were going to do. What it proves and what it tells us is that they are multiple, that they can do a lot of different things. They're very versatile on offense. That's a great mm-hmm. thing to be in. You guys were talking about the offense and how it, it could be one of the highest producing offenses in the NFL. They were prior to the Tampa game. They were up there in the numbers statistically. Mm-hmm. The issue is they're just not finding the end zone as much as they can. Obviously, that happens whenever you're fumbling the ball in the red zone. And of course, you anticipate those things to get fixed. Desmond understands that you can't drop the ball right before you cross the line, and he's not going to do that again. So yeah, of course, I think that you know you take advantage of Bijan Robinson being back, being healthy. The headache thing is not an issue. He said he'll be ready to go. So mm-hmm. take advantage of that. Take advantage of the fact that you got really good usage out of CP probably for the first time this year. And then also yeah. Tyler Algier had a good game again. Um, he's been a little quiet just because you didn't really need him in a lot of scenarios, but he can be used for you. And both of these defenses are tricky. Both teams are not allowing anything over 20 points per game in offenses so far this year. So the Falcons do have a really unique opportunity here. Uh, pass the ball, but also mix it up. And I think that that's what they've done really well. Again, I say confusing because they come out with something different every week, which is a good mm-hmm. thing because Arthur Smith said, this is a league where you get exposed and they try to nitpick you. So I think it's a good opportunity for them to show us some new things this week. Indeed. And real quick, that defense is going to have fun with the Falcons as far as, yeah, keeping teams under 20 points per game is what they've been able to do. And that's when those teams actually know what the heck they're going to get under center. Not so much for the Titans, because, of course, Ryan Tannehill is not going to be under center for them. The word from uh, Mike Vrabel is that at least from a primary perspective, if you if you will, Will Levis is going to be their primary QB, Maria, but they'll probably still get some time from Malik Willis. That said, does getting those guys, whether it's Levis in doses, Willis in big doses or the like, change anything for Ryan Nielsen or no? Uh, I mean, I think it can, certainly, just because you don't really know what's going to be put back there. You do have an idea of, yes, you're going to see both quarterbacks to some extent. So, of course, they're game planning for both Malik Willis and Will Levis. The Mm -hmm. difference is you have not seen the rookie quarterback so far this year. You have no idea what he's going to give you. You even heard Calais Campbell say, I'm not going to go back and look at his previous tape. I'm just going to do what I do and hope I welcome him to the NFL in the correct way, which is getting after the quarterback a couple of times. You saw this Falcons team, specifically on the defensive side of the ball blitz a lot against Tampa and that was great I'd love to see that and that's really what they've gone after is trying to be intense attack and aggressive is Ryan Nielsen's slogan it has been since he got into the Falcons and took over on defense Mm -hmm. so attack and aggressive is great but they need to start taking the ball away more and this is a great opportunity make the young quarterback uncomfortable force him into some throws that Jesse Bates can get after because remember they have put some pressure on they're just not turning the ball over and when these guys talk about the next level on defense I think that's where it kind of lies and if they can flip that with a quarterback who hasn't been out there yet yeah they have a great opportunity I still think the game plan is the same though prepare for all scenarios um and definitely give Will Levis the welcome to the NFL moment that Calais was talking about yeah and I think the same if they go with Malik Willis because at the end of the day those are two QBs who just don't have a lot of experience under their belt And that's something that the Falcons, I believe their defense is going to be able to exploit. Now, if you want to take control of your health, let me tell you how with Jace Medical. And, you know, we talked about just a few moments ago being opportunistic, right? That's what you're looking for in the Falcons this weekend when they take on the Titans. Well, Jace Medical gives you a unique opportunity as well. You know, we were living in a time right now of a lot of uncertainty. Supply chain chain shortages is a result of that for medications. Sometimes you're not able to get them in a timely manner, if at all. And as also telemedicine expands, that gives an opportunity for an organization like Jace Medical to bring you quality service to more and more people who need it. So consider the Jace case. It provides five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use. All it takes to get a case is filling out a simple online form, and you can get ongoing care from Jace Physicians on any treatment-related question and have peace of mind when you're traveling, like I did when I traveled to Africa recently or when you have limited access to healthcare. So Jace Medical now offers customizability for your Jace case with dozens of add-on medications. It continually works to expand medication offerings. They've added something called ivermectin as an option in the case. It's an anti-parasitic medication for conditions like scabies and like lice. So if you care about the health of yourself 
your family, your friends, go ahead and buy them a gift card for the holidays. It's actually going to be a useful gift for them because they can get a Jace case of their own. So go to jacemedical.com and enter code locked on at checkout for a $20 discount on your order. That's promo code locked on at J A S E medical.com. Jace Medical is doctor created and it's doctor recommended. All right, guys, so let's take a deep dive and run it back to Wednesday night. The Hawks had their season opener. They're on the road to open the season at the Hornets. Only the second time in 23 years have they opened the season in, in the uh, against the Hornets, rather. And unfortunately, same result. 23 years ago, take it out. Last night or Wednesday night, 116 to 110, Hawks taking L again, Maria. Did it seem like the same old Hawks to you? And if so, how? I think in some regards, yes, but in some regards, no, which is yeah. kind of a ridiculous answer. But seriously, no, I, I mean, you. I did see improvements on the defensive side of the ball for sure, yes. um, especially in the first half. They had nine steals. They had 10 total over the course of the game. So you saw them being a little bit more aggressive defensively, which you're going to get out of a Quinn Snyder team. Um, the issue obviously was beyond the arc and the fact that they couldn't let shots fall and the chemistry between Trey Young and DeJounte Murray. When those guys are going a combined seven for 33 from the yeah. floor and between the two of them they only hit one three-pointer yeah it's not going to win you a lot of basketball games it's just not so they have to figure out how one of them needs to have a good night or the other or both combined would be the ideal situation right that's why you have them both back there and why mm -hmm. it's supposedly one of the best backcourts in the league but when they're both struggling it's just going to be really, really hard. And we saw a lot of sloppy basketball on yeah. both ends of the floor, especially right out the gate. And I think that comes with just the beginning of the year for a lot of teams, and especially a team like this trying to figure some stuff out with Quinn. Um, so I'm not totally concerned considering it's one of 82. However, if you're going to be an offensive team, where was it? I, I was just confused by that. But the good news is, and the bright shining spot was, of course, Jalen Johnson having a career night. Trey Young afterwards saying he expects him to have many more career nights. I think we all do, right? Um, so it was good to see Jalen take that next step forward. A kid that doesn't have a lot of experience yet so far. He's going to play a lot more, I think, under Quinn Snyder. So yeah, that was kind of a long-winded answer to tell you in some regards, yes, but I was pleasantly surprised. I don't want to say pleasantly surprised. I was surprised at how much defensive attack they had, at least in the beginning. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that kind of Jarvis maybe, and just kind of going in the direction of what Maria was talking about as it relates to Dejan Trey, call it what you want. It's kind of fun yeah. still for me to call it that, but um, I love <laughs> to it. call that backcourt of the Hogs yeah. that. But I think Maria makes a great point about what may have been the cause of why the Hogs kind of look same old, but maybe not same old. And the reason I say that is this because, yeah, you look at what Trey and Dejounte weren't able to do offensively, but I think in part that may be because you saw things that, hey, we're not accustomed to seeing. You saw it a couple times in the preseason, and that was, for example, Trey Young taking charges. It's just not something that we've seen in terms of him being really committed to defense, and I think that's a part of it. So Jarvis, when you are com that committed to defense like the team was, I wonder if maybe – it wasn't so much the same old, same old from this duo or from this team as it was, hey, LaMelo Ball was healthy. He went off. Terry Rozier is who they call Scary Terry. He went off. So you look at that backcourt for the Hornets. They score 39 points, but it was quality shooting, right? Because they're scoring that on 11 of 21 from the field. And they're also hitting a little bit better, 6 of 18 from 3. But most importantly, maybe Jarvis, it was more of the same because of what those guys were able to do as well. Yeah, I think we look at how the game started, right? Like you yeah. start to see some of the new things. You start to see active hands. You start to see them yeah. forcing turnovers. And and like what I think uh, Sadiq Bey ended up with like five steals. And yes. those are some of the things that you just kind of say, okay, this is different. You know, and you see the guys taking the charges, like Maria mentioned. Those are some of the things that are just different, right? Like, so mm -hmm. I can't sit up here and say that, oh man, same old Hawks. I'm just like, right. if people were saying that, they didn't watch the game. Because, yeah. you know, like, don't don't get me wrong, I did feel like at some points during those games, I was just like, man, cringeworthy. <laughs> you know, but but for me, it was a it was a it was a it was a sight for sore eyes because you to see those guys out there 
competing on defense and, and actually, you know, taking pride in it. And then when Jalen Johnson comes in, comes off the bench, and they, they just go on a run. And, and just was like, oh, my God, like, who is this dude? Like, I'm talking about they just giving the ball and, like, and, and, and getting out the way. And I was like, we're doing this for Jalen Johnson? I'm like, what is going on? So, yeah, this team is different. And, and I think that, you know, this is the guy that I call. I say, hey, this is Jalen Johnson is going to be the guy that can, that can make this team look different, that can make this team to continue to elevate. If he can get to the point where he's coming off the bench, I'm not saying I'm expecting to have a career high off the bench every night. Like Trey Young mentioned, but you know, if he can be give you 15, 16 off the off the bench, that is quality, quality yeah. contribution coming off your bench that is gonna get you to that point where you might be saying, Hey, this is the bench mob 2, 2.0. I know that'd be great. And when I think about Jalen Johnson from like the beginning, I remember when he came in as a rookie. I asked if I could have a one-on-one -on -one with him, and I can remember him just being so timid, very nice. Very nice guy, but just so timid. And I was like, wow, I sure hope there's some aggression that's there that maybe I'm not seeing that can come out on the court. Oh, and then good. I had an opportunity to cover the G League as their TV sideline reporter for, for the Skyhawks. And to see where Jalen Johnson was when I started that season with them versus where he was by the end of that season. Of course, a season where he also started called up more, right? Yeah. That's when I said, yeah, I think there's something special about him. I think he's starting to feel where they want him to be and they're starting to figure out where they want him to be. I think the other thing is this, when you give him the opportunity and you give him liberty to be who he wants to be, and then you get him with a guy like a Kyle Korver and you say, Hey, help this guy get an outside side, outside shot. And he says, okay, I'm eager to learn. I'm ready to do that. Couple that with telling him to go ahead and get his beast on the inside on and you know show all that grime and that grit that you actually have i think that's what we're starting to see a guy that's going to have a breakout season because he's being allowed and being encouraged to just be jalen johnson and that's why like you all said they just kind of stood back and said let jalen go because once they let him rip they absolutely let him rip now on the flip side and i kind of call it the not say i'll say not triumvirate because I think it was more than three players, to be honest with you. But I think it was kind of a situation where it was a committee. It was kind of small forward slash power forward by committee. And the reason I bring this up, Maria, is because we cannot get around the conversation of this was our first time looking at, we'll say, a new look Hawks, meaning sans John Collins. And so it's very interesting because if you were paying attention to the trends on social media last night, it was like, yeah, we miss John Collins. We can tell that he's not there. We we miss his presence. And I was thinking, so maybe these people don't kind of see Sadiq Bey and what he's able to do. And I know Anyaka was in foul trouble last night, but there were still some shades of showing you why that guy is able to keep the likes of Giannis Antetokounmpo in check. And then, like you guys said, Jalen Johnson. So just had to ask, Maria, as far as the elephant is in the room, yes, it was small forward, power forward by committee. But from what you saw from that committee, did you feel like they still did some good work? Or did you feel like on some level, yeah, kind of missing JC. We're going to miss him this season. I think it's just going to be one of those things where you're – getting used to not seeing him out there. That's all that I think it is. I think they are going to take a step in the right direction. And I think yesterday was total proof of that. And like you mentioned, if you're not watching the game, it's evident when you say, I don't know what was going on there when Sadiq Bey is doing great things. He looked like he took a step forward, in my opinion, last night. Yes. And yes. I think that if you can rely on a couple different guys, that's good. But you need someone, obviously, to step up in the absence of John Collins. However, I, I don't think he was a popular player. And so I think that people who don't watch the games think, okay, John Collins, he's the guy, the end. I think that they're going to be just fine without him. He yes. dropped off in production massively in his last couple of years with the Hawks. Everyone knows that, which is part of the reason why he was able to depart and you didn't get much for him. But I really do think that they're going to be fine without him. Anyeka, when he is not in foul trouble, will help you big yes. time there. Um, so between him, Sadiq, and of course, Jalen, I think they're going to be fine. Yeah, we don't want another 7.5 rebound, five personal foul night from double O, but right. you know that the potential is there. And I think to your point, Maria and JD, when a team says, hey, we're going to pick up the fourth year options, we're going to pick up Jalen Johnson's option, we're going to pick up Onyeka Okongu's option, they're showing you that they see something in this team, in these players that they feel can be a part of the core of what they're trying to build. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's cool to see, right? Because it gives you hope. Like, because, like, We've 
as Hawks fan, as a Hawks fan, and, and, and being in this city for so time, for so for so long, you know, growing up here, it's just like I want to see some 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 growth. Like that's what yeah. we want to see from this team because they didn't go out and, and go trade for James Harden or God forbid they ever do that. Right. But you know, they didn't go out, <laughs> they didn't make the big splash move. Hey, they resigned to Jonte Murray, and people were surprised. I know I was included in that party as well because. You know, like he could have possibly got some more money on the on the open market. So sure. it's just for for them to resign him and then you trade away John Collins, like you mentioned. You know, like you said, people who are saying that they're missing him, y'all not watching the games. I need y'all to watch start watching the games because there is a plan in place. They had a, they have a they have a recession plan for sure. Because like you said, John, you know, he did what he did when he was here with the Hawks. Like he did, he did. Nobody expected the, for him to have that type of production when he came in to, uh, to the Atlanta Hawks because he got better every year after year after year. But like you said, like Maria's mentioned, he started to tail off in those last couple of years. That's why you weren't able to get that much from him. So yeah. I, I feel like, you know, it's just a matter of, like you said, getting used to him not being there. But please believe Quinn Snyder has has a plan and we saw that play out last night with Sadiq Bay and Jalen Johnson kind of rotating that bad boy out and I'm cool with it. Can I say one thing real quick? Yeah, absolutely. What you know, one thing that I think people are forgetting and I think it's just because Quinn is so new and this is the mm -hmm. first full season is he's so much a player's coach. So yeah, when you're absolutely. talking about investing in these guys, these younger guys that are signing these deals and then also bringing DeJounte back obviously, Quinn mm -hmm. is a guy that can change someone's game and i truly yes. do believe that and you're starting to see snippets of that if you're at practice if you're watching the videos at practice he is very much a hands-on coach and he talks to them in ways that has not happened around here in quite yeah. a long time he has a different way of connecting with players and i think that's overlooked sometimes and not to mention kyle corver being in your back part pocket i mean oh my yeah. gosh who else could you want he's such a smart and bright individual mm -hmm. and he obviously played in the nba for a while so he's somebody that you can rely on that the guys trust they listen to so i think that you're really going to start to see that turn into something great i.e in the absence of a john collins and trying yeah. to grow these other players it's important that you have a coach finally that the guys really do respect and they listen to i think that's really important to mention yeah and we always thought that rudy gobert was a solid player that he was good but his greatness is because of the guy who really got him from good to great and was able yeah. to get things out of him that no other coach was able to do that before. And if we're being honest about it, has been able to do since then. Now, coming up next, we're going to go around the Metro. But first, Jarvis is going to tell you guys about how FanDuel can help you make a few extra bucks, especially heading into the holidays, and how you can get your fix of Jarvis if you so choose to get more Jarvis with subtext. Listen up, people. Jarvis Davis here. Yeah, you're going to get that fixed in one second. But let me tell you about FanDuel. This is the episode of the ATL Sports Party. It's brought to you by FanDuel. It is the number one sports book in America, guys. I'm telling you, you need to go to FanDuel right now. For new customers, just new customers, you've been winning some money already. Cool. Keep doing your thing. But the people who haven't gone there yet, I need you to go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. Why I need to go to FanDuel.com slash locked on? You need to go to FanDuel.com slash locked on because all you got to do is drop five bucks. Five books, and you're gonna get two hundred dollars in bonus bets, guaranteed. What are bonus bets, Jarvis? You can use those on spreads, player props, over unders, and much, much more. I'm telling you guys, you don't have to worry about anybody getting your information when it comes to FanDuel because the app is safe, secure, it's super easy to use, and it's the number one sports book in America. So, what's the hold up? Swole up? All right. So visit FanDuel.com/slash/lockedon. That's FanDuel.com/slash/lockedon. L O C K D E E D. That's FanDuel .com slash locked on. L -O -C -K -D -E -E -D. O N, excuse me, and go to the official sportsbook betting partner of the NFL. Now, guys, let me talk to you. I need to, like, I need y'all to listen up right now. My voice again changing up, so that means you need to pay attention. Come here. If you want to become a Locked On Sports Atlanta insider, all you got to do, join subtext.com slash locked on sports Atlanta. Join subtext.com slash locked on sports Atlanta. What is that, Jarvis? I'm telling you, all you got to do is just listen to me. Listen to me. I'm telling you where to go and where to go get some good information. You're going to be able to get some good information, inside information, all of that breaking news, all that, all my thoughts during the game. I'm telling you, you can text with me during the game. Why are you watching the game? And also, I got a little all 22 review, too, if y'all want to you know, check that out as well. So all of that will be available on the subtext. Join subtext.com slash Locked On Sports Atlanta and become a Locked On Sports Atlanta insider today.
Maria, I think Jarvis has taught both of us a new phrase. Did I hear hold on for your swole on? Okay, I just don't know. Okay, I thought oh, he no, talked. I don't know what I said. <laughs> I don't know what I said. I just lost him though. Yeah, Maria, I was like, okay, we'll just let him roll with that because I have no clue what he is talking about <laughs> any more than I have a clue of what goes on at the world's biggest cocktail party. We know that they don't like us to refer to that, but hey, for the 102nd time, I'm sure... This is the 102nd time we're referring to it as such. We're talking Georgia, Florida, this Saturday afternoon in Jayville. It's going down. And listen, I like the concept of the world's biggest cocktail party because I'm from New Orleans and everything is a party, right, Maria? But I wanted to know from your perspective, I know I haven't had the good fortune yet of covering this game in Jacksonville, but you have. And so how fun has that been for you? Has that been one, if not the most fun you've had covering a game? Yeah, I mean, the most fun is really hard just because I have covered so much fun stuff, you know, but yeah. it's definitely one of the best things in college football for sure. Although I am, I'm sorry, everyone, I do think it should be played in Athens. And Agreed. In um, oh, yes. But, Absolutely. However, Agreed. I will say that it, it is such a cool environment. I mean, you literally, you turn the corner and you see people grilling gator and there's just people doing keg stands everywhere. It's like the craziest thing you've ever seen. And mm-hmm. I am someone that went to Ole Miss and so tailgate. Getting is our thing and yes, i know what good tailgating looks like right and it's wild i mean people show up and show out doesn't matter how bad florida is <clears throat> but also <laughs> people will go and especially because it's in jacksonville but it's wild yeah. i mean you can see campers for miles and it's just such a cool scene flags there's people standing on top of trailers like it is just it's it's a blast and no matter what happens no matter how bad the teams are it's a crazy wild atmosphere. People barking at each other and chomping at each other. It's it's everything good in college football in one game. Indeed. It almost sounds like Jarvis, both teams, both the Florida fan base and the Georgia fan base have an opportunity for two homecomings in one season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, those type of games, like I think Maria is on to something. Like, and I think, you know, Kirby Smart has said, said it as such. Like, this should be a home and home game because you're talking about from a recruiting aspect yeah. and just the absolute. Oh my God, the bedlam that will be going on in those stadiums when they they go back and forth, you know, uh, every year because no matter how bad these teams are, or you know, obviously Georgia hasn't been on that side in quite some time, but you know, Florida has. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, you just look at it from a standpoint of like it's always going to be a, a, a dog fight, you know, pun intended. Uh, so I think I think that you know when having these games at home and home, it's just the atmosphere and just how everything is. I remember my first time covering the Georgia game. I was just like, at the beginning of the game, they were like, all right, but everybody stand on their feet. You know, we want to give all the honor and glory to Georgia, Georgia Bulldog football. I was like, wait a minute. Did I step into a new religion? What's going on here? So, just like, so you know, like, yeah, it's it's real. It's real down there, T. Like, so, yeah, it's the experience down there, you know, with these two teams getting together. And just anytime Georgia is playing, it's just – it's just a really cool thing. And for these guys to be able to get it on down there in Jacksonville, it's going to be pretty cool. Yeah, and it's one of those where it's on the bucket list of games to cover just because, hey, look, you all know, I'm always about that life of a homecoming bucket list, right? I just yeah. checked off another one last week that I didn't even know I needed in my life. I went to Columbia, South Carolina to do color commentary for a game. And uh, let me tell you, that game was like, it was bedlam for homecoming. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm sure UGA is on 10. And like Jarvis, haven't gotten to Jacksonville to cover UGA quite yet. But man, listen, I've gotten to Athens a couple times and I'm like, yeah, this really does rise to the level of a different religion. But I don't think, guys, that anything's going to be different in the outcome Saturday because I think that the Atlanta Sports Party would all agree that this is still going to be a dub for UGA. So listen, you guys, be sure to check out our Locked On Sports Atlanta channel on YouTube. We appreciate you, as always, stopping by the Atlanta Sports Party. and. We look forward to seeing you guys again come Monday on the Atlanta Football Party.